Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to MIT Faculty Forum Online. I am Anil Anantaswamy, a 2020 MIT Knight Science Journalism Fellow, and I will moderate today's webcast. Today's broadcast is sponsored in part by the MIT Federal Credit Union, MIT Professional Education, and MIT Sloan Executive Education. As a reminder, we welcome your questions during this chat. Alumni joining us via Zoom can use the Q&A feature found on your toolbar. We will get to as many questions as we can. We're talking today about Mars and the MIT project MOXIE, short for Mars Oxygen In-Situ Resource Utilization Experiment. It is led by an MIT Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics team and embedded in the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover, which launched last week. Our panelists today hope to demonstrate through MOXIE a way that future explorers might produce oxygen from the Martian atmosphere for propellant and for breathing. Joining us are Drs. Michael Hecht and Jeffrey Hoffman, principal and deputy principal investigators for MOXIE, and their graduate students, Maya Nasser, Eric Hinterman, and Justine Schulz. You can find their bios linked from the event page for today's talk. Let's hear from them now. Uh, we'll start with uh, Dr. Jeffrey Hoffman for a, a brief introduction to the Mars uh, 2020 Perseverance Rover project, and then uh, Dr. Hecht will uh, give his uh, presentation. So Dr. Hoffman, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Anil. Uh... Hello to everybody. Uh, I'm going to share my screen to share a uh, beautiful picture of last Thursday's launch. This was taken from an altitude of 5,000 feet. And uh, of course, the, uh, the great thing about this was that uh, inside that, uh, or on top of that Atlas V rocket and the Centaur upper stage, which finally uh, sent us on our way to Mars, was um, uh, let me share my screen again. There we go. Um, uh, a, a remarkably complicated rover. And in uh, schematic, um, this, this rover is kind of the culmination of the last 13 years of Mars exploration uh, with more and more complex rovers. Um, of course, most of the experiments are oriented towards understanding the geology of Mars, uh, the atmosphere of Mars, but this has some unique elements. There's a ground penetrating radar, which uh, not only can look at underlying surface structure, but if there's any water or ice under there, it can pick it out. Um, there will be for the very first time, the flight of an aerodynamic vehicle, a helicopter, uh, and remember that Mars atmosphere uh, at the surface of Mars is the equivalent of about 100,000 feet on the Earth, and we don't fly helicopters that high. So that's going to be an amazing thing. And then finally, for the very first time, um, something that scientists have been requesting for decades now, um, this rover, Perseverance, is going to set the stage for bringing actual samples of Mars back to the Earth. It will collect the samples and leave them for uh, collection by another mission, which will hopefully launch in about five years. So it's uh, extremely exciting. And of course, we're excited because in the belly of the uh, rover is our MOXIE experiment, which you're going to hear about now from uh, Dr. Mike Heck. Uh, it was mentioned that uh, the MIT Aero Astro Department was working on that, but uh, we also have to mention the Haystack Observatory, where Mike is the Associate Director of Research and is working with many other people there to, uh, to make MOXIE a reality. So I'll stop sharing my screen and turn it over to you, Mike. Thanks very much, Jeff. And what I would like to do is to set the stage a little bit, uh, describe the journey that led us to MOXIE and the Perseverance mission, as Jeff described. And really that journey starts back in 1976 when I entered uh, the, the uh, brotherhood of the MIT alumni, or at least began my MIT journey in a master's program in astrophysics. 
uh, in fact, where I was working for a young astrophysics professor by the name of Jeff Hoffman, the same one you just heard from. And uh, that lasted all of about a year and a half. And then I transferred to Stanford where I went into a different area entirely and ended up in, in uh, 19, uh, 1982 at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I spent 30 years at JPL and was privileged during that time to work on a number of projects associated with the Mars program, but, but none as significant to me as the opportunity, the, the privilege to lead an instrument suite that was flown on the Phoenix mission in 2007, landed in 2008, but really began back in the mid 1990s, something like 1996. And the reason this is relevant is that this was an unusual instrument suite for JPL because JPL normally is only concerned with science missions from the science directorate, exploring the science of the solar system and earth and astrophysics. Uh, whereas this mission was initiated by the human exploration, what was called then the human exploration and development of space organization, hence. Um, and at the time, they, while well, they were super consumed and, and in, in, in debt over trying to build a space station, what an endeavor. Nonetheless, Dan Golden, who was the administrator at the time and was a, uh, a visionary, if you will, he didn't want to forget that we we're going to Mars someday. In fact, a little bit uh, troubling is that he said, we're going to Mars in as soon as 15 years. And I say that's troubling because today we're saying we're going to Mars in 15 years. I think today we're serious, but he thought we might go to Mars as soon as 2011. And so they said, it's time to get busy. We don't have time left. We have to solve problems. We have to make sure these astronauts can be safe when they're on the ground. And that means understanding the radiation when you're on the ground and experiencing all the secondaries from you know, the cosmic ray bombardment. Um, it means worrying about the environment, which primarily Ignore what you saw on the Martian. It's not about storms blowing over your, your rocket, your ascent vehicle. It's about primarily dust and soil. That's the stuff you interact with. And on the moon, even in a few days, that was a huge, huge problem. So safety. Landing a big payload. We've never landed anything close to as huge as, as a crewed mission on another planet before. Um, you know, the moon doesn't, doesn't count, very low gravity. And so we have to learn how to do that. That was, a, that was another priority. And the third one after safety and landing was logistics. How do we get all that stuff we need to Mars? How do we get it all in one place? How do we you know, deal with the risk and the complexity and ultimately the cost you know, and still make this happen in the time frame we're thinking about? We need some help and the help was thought to be, and this was true since Werner von Braun first started talking about this in the 50s, was thought to be in the form of ISRU, as Jeff mentioned, the in-situ resource utilization. And in those days, they primarily were concerned about propellant. I'll get to that in a minute. So they used the acronym ISPP for in-situ propellant production. So why? Well, it's simple because if you're going to get some help by, if you will, living off the land, um, then you want to do that where it's the lowest risk and the largest impact. And the largest impact is to find the biggest single thing, the heaviest single thing you would otherwise have to get to Mars and see if you can make it there practically, pragmatically. So what is the biggest thing? Of course, you need a, you know, a habitat, you need transportation, you need all the life support stuff. You need a very big power system, 25 to 30 kilowatts is the estimate. And you need, as I already mentioned, you need a way to get home. You need a launch vehicle to take the crew at the end of the mission, at least back to orbit where they can you know, rejoin a shuttle waiting in orbit to come back to, to Earth. And to get that ascent vehicle off the ground is a very big deal which is obvious when you think about how huge the rocket is that gets them off the ground from Earth to begin with. Fortunately, Mars only has about one third the gravity, so you don't need a rocket as big as an atlas, but you still need a big rocket. So that's where you focus. That's the big thing. 
And on the rocket, what's the big thing? Well, it turns out, this isn't quite as obvious. It turns out the big heavy thing, 25 tons or so, is an a tank full of oxygen. Okay, not the fuel, the oxygen, because a rocket, like anything that uses fuel, like us, has to breathe. Like us, like a fire, like an airplane, we all have to breathe. But of all of, all, all of those, the rocket's the only one that has to bring their oxygen with them to, to burn the fuel. And not only that, but when you burn fuel against oxygen, the oxygen is almost all of the weight. Uh, you can easily see that, that the chemistry of combustion ultimately turns into often making water, making H2O. And so you've got two atomic mass units for the two hydrogens, H2, and 16 for the O. So the oxygen is going to weigh several times at least what the fuel is going to weigh, even if the fuel is something like methane. It, it's still several times as much. Okay, so if you could make the oxygen on Mars, you could take a huge chunk out of the manifest for this mission. And so can it be done robotically? Can it be done practically? Well, it, it's serendipitous, that serendipitously, that's about the easiest thing to make. First of all, everything has oxygen in it, rock, you know, silica uh, uh, in the soil, uh, ice, there's ice on the planet, if you could find it and bring it back. Um, uh, you know, we know where it is, but it's not near the landing site. And the atmosphere has oxygen in it. So lots of sources. The one that's pragmatic, the only one that's practical is to take it out of the atmosphere. So what is that atmosphere? Well, it turns out there's not much of it. It's about 1% of, you know, the thickness of Earth, even less 1% as dense as Earth's atmosphere. But all but a few percent is carbon dioxide, CO2. And that's great because here on Earth, we know how to, well, Mother Nature knows how to make oxygen out of CO2. That's how we have oxygen here to begin with because flora, trees do it every day. Trees take in oxygen, they take in solar power, they can do a lot of chemistry and they turn oxygen into CO2. So since we can't bring a rainforest to Mars, um, what can we do? And can we do a electronic tree? Can we bring an electronic tree to Mars? Um, and it turns out, in fact, you can. And um, back to finish this the talk discussion of this mission that was planned in the in 96, there were several instruments on the mission that never flew, but one was called the Mars ISPP prototype, the MIP, okay? The, and it was actually a tiny version of what it now became MOXIE, much less capable, but it used electrolysis, solid oxide electrolysis to turn a little bit of CO2 into a little bit of oxygen. Okay, and I'll describe how it works later. But now I wanna fast forward to 2012, where after 30 years I left JPL and was very fortunate to, find, to be able to come back to MIT after all these years and back home. I'm, I'm from Boston originally, grew, you know, Dorchester, grew up in Newton. Uh, so came back home and one of the extra bonuses was having an opportunity to, 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 to reunite with Jeff, uh, who I hadn't seen in many, many years. And shortly after, sometime after I left MIT, he left and entered the astronaut program and had if you will, after being an astrophysicist, he had a stellar career as an astronaut. Um, uh, apologies for the pun. Um, and so when human exploration, once again, I, maybe a year, year later, a year and a half later, turned their eyes back to going to Mars and said, okay, we want to have the same questions we had before. We have the same questions about landing. We have the same questions about safety and we have the same questions about logistics. Uh, we're going to invest in this ISRU idea again because we never flew it. It was a natural partnership between me and Jeff and Jeff Propulsion Laboratory to put together a competitive proposal to you know, pick up where MIP left off, if you will. And we did that partnership um, and we were successful, obviously, and we brought in the MOXIE program. Uh, it's been a really eventful several years. I found that even after all these years, Jeff is still my teacher and I learn from him every day. Uh, and that's been a particular delight. But boy, after all these years, the, the thrill of the launch on Thursday, seeing that perfect launch in the morning was just, you know, it doesn't get old. It just does not get old. 
So let me let me spend a little time talking about boxing before I turn it back over uh, to Jeff. So this is what you know. This is what it looks like in a in a nice colorful plastic solid model. This is actual size. So the whole thing is the size of a car battery. It of course has skins around the outside, and I will show you a picture before I finish up. Um, and this will make oxygen out of the Martian atmosphere, even at the very high altitude landing site we're landing at, which has an even thinner atmosphere than everywhere else we've ever landed. But we can still make about six to 10 grams in oxy of oxygen an hour uh, if, you know, if, uh, when we land. And uh, you know, that's the equivalent actually of a modest sized tree. So we may not be sending the forest, but we're sending the tree. Um, why so little? It turns out we will need on a full scale mission about 200 times that capacity, more like two to three kilograms an hour. But we will also have on that full scale mission 25 to 30 kilowatts of power. And this whole rover, even though it's the size of a small car, runs off of just over 100 watts. It's extraordinary. That's why it moves so slow. Um, so even if we save up a whole day's worth of power in the battery, we get about a kilowatt hour, and we sort of stretch that out over a few hours to operate MOXIE. So six to 10 grams per hour, scaling it up won't be that difficult as long as we have the power system. So this is really truly a demonstration that we can take this terrestrial technology and take it all the way to Mars um, and have it work in that environment. Okay, so first of all, um, what does it do? Well, this green piece here, you have to collect all that rarefied atmosphere and compress it to the point that you can actually process it. So this is indeed a mechanical compressor. And while that sounds straightforward, you wanna collect air and compress it, get a compressor. It actually was a really rocky journey to get to that very simple conclusion. Air Squared Company in Colorado, who makes compressors, uh, makes scroll compressors for a living, learned how to do a flight instrument and this is very heavily customized for Mars. Um, the, uh, the, from there, you have to send the CO2 into the electrolysis system, which is the guts of all this. This is a solid oxide electrolysis system, normally called a SOX. So I insisted the model makers make it red so I could have a red SOX in, on my model. Um, sorry again. And um, how is it we even know how to do that? Well, the reason is that, that this, the technology derives from something we do regularly, which is fuel cells. That we, would, we will combust fuel and oxygen regularly and make water and electricity, or in this case, CO2 and electricity. And while it's a, the material is a little more complicated than this, you can effectively switch the polarity of the voltage and run it backwards and put in CO2 and put in oxygen and get out the product CO and O out of CO2. So carbon monoxide and oxygen, and we all know carbon monoxide is the stuff that makes the alarms go off in our basement. Why not go all the way to carbon? It's very simple. If we go to C plus O2, we get carbon deposits and that stops the whole show. So we have to be very, very careful to you know, to, to pry one oxygen atom out of the CO2 molecule and not two to make this work. And then we have two gaseous, two gaseous products. Sorry about that. I, my computer seems to think it's a phone. Okay, um, so anyway, the rest of this stuff is just all, um, it's, it's flow control and it's all the sensors that really help us know what's going on in MOXIE and how we, how we know back on Earth what's going on. I'm just gonna take another maybe minute at most and share my screen just to show you a picture of it in real life. And uh, let's see, share, the, and then I will turn this over to Jeff. So where are we? PowerPoint, there we go. Okay, so this was uh, MOXIE being put back, put together. So there's what it looks like, as you, you can see those same components, but, but the SOXIE assembly, which is a little tiny thing, but it's all wrapped up in, in insulators and things to compress it. And boy, combining compressing and insulating in one technology at 800 degrees C is really a trick. But they, we did that, uh, then it's all wrapped up in a skin and um, 
Let's go, let's go forward here, please. Come on, you can do this. You can do this. Doesn't want to do it. Oh, there we go. Okay. So then it's all wrapped up in the skin. It's covered up like that. Uh, the electronics go on. The sensor panel gets on, goes on. As you can see, it's all wrapped. It's all in gold. I asked the project manager, why bother to plate aluminum with gold, which is a, a you know kind of an odd system. And he looked at me with a totally straight face and said, if we made it out of solid gold, it would be too heavy. So that's JPL for you. And um, uh, yeah, there's someone commented, the real stocks is not red, just the one in my model. This is it being tested, Moxie being tested in a bell jar, and this is Moxie actually being loaded into the rover. So I will conclude by just bringing this up because in addition to JPL, and I mentioned Air Squared, I didn't mention a couple of the heroes, uh, one being a company formerly called Ceramitech, that was part of the Adolf Kors empire, and now is its own small company, Oxion Energy, uh, that um, uh, made the, the uh, electrolysis system, at least the, the, the guts of it, the, the part that converts CO2 into oxygen and brilliant dedicated uh, uh, folks that are still heavily involved with the mission and various other universities and institutions. And again, highlighting that this is a three-way partnership within NASA, human exploration, space technology, and the science directorate to make it possible. So from there, I will turn back to Jeff. Apologies for running a bit long and um, take it away. Happy to answer questions afterwards. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um... Yeah, I have to say when Mike and I saw one another um, when he came back to MIT after 30 years, we both looked a little bit different, you know, not quite so much hair on top, but that's that's the way it goes. And I'm sure all MIT alumni uh, recognize what happens uh, when you're an alumni for a long enough time. But anyway, what I'd like to do is is very briefly to give you an idea of what's going to happen to MOXIE now that it's been launched and it's on its way to Mars. And then finally, what we're gonna do with MOXIE here at MIT, because you know we're all MIT and, and that's important. So uh, the whole rover with MOXIE aboard is on its way. We had a great launch. It's about a, Mars is, is relatively close to the earth this time around. So it's, it's only a seven month trip. We will land on Mars on the 18th of February. Um, and of course, we will, if, if any of you remember the Curiosity landing with that, uh, what they call the seven minutes of terror, where you have to get through the Mars atmosphere and the heating, and then it comes down on a parachute, and then it comes down on a rocket, and then finally a sky crane. We're going to do exactly the same thing. Although it's going to be even more interesting because we're going to have cameras which are going to record the opening of the parachutes and and microphones to record the sounds of entry into mars so stand by for some uh, real excitement but let's hope then we get safely on the surface of mars <clears throat> on february the 18th uh, the first thing that will happen over the over the first few days of of that week is we we've got to make sure that the rover has survived and then one by one, we'll, we'll turn on all the instruments just to make sure that everybody survived. So hopefully we'll get data back from MOXIE, uh, knowing that we, we survived both the launch and the journey and the landing. Then about a week after that, we'll have the opportunity uh, one by one to turn on the individual parts of MOXIE. We'll turn on the compressor, make sure that it's working then we'll turn it off, we'll turn on the heaters for the uh, solid oxide electrolysis unit, make sure that that's working. We'll turn on the, the voltages and, and so on. We hope everything will be working fine. And then the big moment will come probably during about the third week that we're on Mars when we actually will make oxygen for the first time. So that's, that's the moment that everybody's been waiting for, the first time that oxygen will be produced on the surface of another planet uh, by human beings or by a machine made by human beings. Now, of course, nobody's there to operate it uh, in real time. It takes 
tens of minutes to get signals back and forth to Mars. And so everything has to be programmed in advance. Uh, and to do that, everything basically runs on software. Uh, and so we have a lot of people at Haystack working on developing the software that's gonna be required. And uh, just uh, because it's, it's important to get students involved in these projects, we have uh, this summer three undergraduate students uh, doing under Europe uh, uh, program the and they're all working uh, on the software. Um, here uh, at MIT, we actually have been given uh, one of the solid oxide electrolysis unit and we're putting together essentially a tabletop version of the MOXIE uh, out at Haystack to begin with. At the moment, of course, it's been difficult getting the labs open, and uh, but eventually that's gonna happen because there's an awful lot of things that we still would like to learn about MOXIE. We, we believe we've, that, that enough testing has been done out at the Jet Propulsion Lab to allow us to operate MOXIE safely on Mars, but there's still an awful lot we'd like to learn, especially because um, what we learn will uh, help people who are designing these larger scale missions uh, which require a lot more oxygen, like Mike was talking about before. Um, and so uh, we are uh, basically, we'll be putting together this lab and um, we have, uh, we'll have students working on that. Um, in fact, um, you'll, you'll hear later from uh, Eric Hinterman, who is specifically working on you know what's required to up the scale up moxie uh, and and from uh, maya nasser who's actually going to be working in the lab essentially calibrating the various um, uh, sensors that that we have on board to measure the different gases that come out um, and because uh, the the uh, heating up of, of MOXIE and the, the thermal characteristics are so important to the process. That's what Justine, who you'll hear from, is, is working on. Uh, eventually, uh, we, we would like to uh, get another uh, working model of MOXIE onto the MIT campus. And I'll just finish up by showing you, uh, let me share my screen here. This uh, is a picture uh, taken in the hall on the ground floor of uh, the McNair building, which some of you will know as building 37, uh, one of the buildings uh, for the, where the Aero Astro department lives. And this is where we're gonna have our on-campus MOXIE lab where, uh, and this is a uh, big window which is gonna be put in in the corridor and we hope that it will become a showcase for people visiting MIT so that they'll be able to look into the MOXIE lab where we will have a, a model of, of MOXIE working and, and people will really understand uh, how MIT is involved in preparing for the future human exploration of Mars. So, uh, I think uh, that's that's enough for me. I'd really like to give our students a little uh, time to talk about what they're doing. And so I'm going to turn it over to um, Maya Nasser. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Maya Nasser, and I'm a third year graduate student um, and Aero Astro working towards my PhD on MOXIE. So I actually joined the MOXIE team all the way back in 2016 when I was in my junior year of my undergraduate degree um, at MIT. And that was for a Super Europe uh, program, which is a year long independent research. 
And my project topic at that point was to really um, study the scaling up or the use of the ISRU uh, produced oxygen from MOXIE to support the Mars ascent vehicle and a Mars sample return mission in the future. So in order to do that, MOXIE has to be scaled up. And my research focused on the extensibility requirements um, for MOXIE to meet the power and the uh, mass and volume requirements of such a future mission. Transitioning from that, I started working for my graduate um, uh, work for my master's and PhD. Uh, I've been focusing on the calibration and characterization of the MOXIE composition sensors. So to give you a tiny bit of a background on that, um, the, for, in order to inform the systems in MOXIE and control them, uh, we have a, a number of temperature, pressure, and composition sensors on board. But those composition sensors are designed for Earth-like operating conditions. So we really, it's really important for us to understand how this behavior and readings differ what we are in an operating environment such as Mars. So we performed a series of experiments under various temperatures, pressures, and kind of an environment that mimics what we can observe on Mars. And the end goal is to really calibrate them appropriately and be able to understand the readings that we get. Um, and finally, I will be focusing on um, also the data processing and analysis, both of the experimental data that we've been doing in the laboratory and will be continuing doing um, on MOXIE, in addition to the real data and telemetry that we get um, from MOXIE when we land on Mars this February. Um, and this is really important to give us uh, a bit of uh, information about how well MOXIE is functioning at its task of producing oxygen on Mars um, and really help us to, to see if it's robust enough um, in, in various operating conditions um, and understand nuances about specific uh, components of, of MOXIE that we have and really optimize its performance over time. So overall, it's been just an amazing four years of working on this project and, uh, and I'm really looking forward to the next few years of my PhD on that. All right. Well, thank you, Maya. Um, Eric, would you like to uh, give yeah. us your presentation, please? Yeah. Sure. I just have a few few slides to share. Um, let me pull these up. Okay. So, like Maya, I've been on working on Moxie for about four years as a uh, now a PhD student, and for my master's degree, I made a simulation um, software model of Moxie. But what I'm actually going to talk to you about for the next couple of minutes is what I'm doing for my dissertation. And that is how to take Moxie and scale it up to a full size to support a human mission. And so I call it the multi-objective system optimization of a Mars atmospheric ISRU plant. But that's kind of a mouthful. So to put it into a, a little bit easier um, to understand concept, this is Moxie. Um, its purpose, as Mike and Jeff have outlined, is to make oxygen as a prototype demonstration. So basically a small scale demonstration of a much larger system that would be needed to make enough oxygen to fill up a Mars ascent vehicle to get astronauts home. So the natural question is, what would it take to design a much larger version of MOXIE that could fill up something like this? Um, this is one of those Mars ascent vehicle designs that we've been talking about. And just for context, I put MOXIE down by the astronauts feet there, if you can see it, uh, to scale. And so you might imagine that we need a, a much bigger system than what MOXIE currently is for a future human mission. And for that reason, there, it's a big systems engineering challenge. There's a lot of different design decisions that need to be made that don't necessarily scale directly from what we've done with MOXIE. And that's what I'm trying to answer. So this is a schematic of major subsystems in an atmospheric ISRU plant for Mars. Real quick, you can see there's a filter to filter out the dust from the Mars atmosphere. Then it gets pulled into what we call an acquisition and compression system. It's basically just a pump or something that moves and compresses the atmosphere. It goes into a solid oxide electrolyzer. That's what actually makes the oxygen like we've been talking about. And then for a full scale system, that oxygen would have to be liquefied and cryogenically stored in a Mars Ascent vehicle propellant tank to be used. And so each of these subsystems has many different ways you could design it. And just as an example for the compression system, here's a couple of um, e examples of different ways you can pull in the Mars atmosphere and compress it. One is called a cryo cooler, and you basically freeze out the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and use that to pressurize it. Uh, a second option is a sorption pump where you use a sorbent bed 
to preferentially absorb CO2 out of a mixed gas stream and use that to compress it. And finally, here's an example of a, what's called a scroll pump, which is what MOXIE uses, but uh, this is just a form of mechanical compression where you physically move and compress the, um, the gas with rotational energy. So these are the sorts of design decisions that I'm trying to model. And the idea is to piece them together into uh, a full scale system model that I can then pass through an optimizer like this that will run through a whole bunch of iterations of different design options and tell me what the optimal choice for a full scale version of Moxie is. And just to wrap up, what you can kind of see happening here is on the left, if you imagine each of these different frames that you're seeing uh, is a different design, a different combination of all those different subsystem options and operating parameters that we have. And on the right, it's trying to minimize something like the total power that the system might use, something important to us like that. And so eventually it'll settle in on the optimal design. And that's what I'm hoping to do. Basically take what we learned from Moxie, plug it into something like this and figure out what a good way to scale it up would be. Great. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, Justine, you're next. I'd love to hear what you have to say. Hi, everybody. I'm Justine Schultz. I am a first year master's student at MIT Aero Astro. Uh, I'm the newest member on the team. And as so, I was given the task of developing a detailed thermal model of stocks, which, uh, as Mike described earlier, is the solid oxide electrolyzer. So what that is, is the component that actually performs the electrolysis, which is the electrical chemical process of converting the carbon dioxide into oxygen in a byproduct. Uh, this model is going to be a detailed combination of thermal aerodynamics and the electrochemical modeling that are all add to uh, where the temperature range of SOX can run at. The importance of this analysis is to build a better model and better understand the performance boundaries and efficiencies and restrictions that come along with running SOX and MOXIE during various ambient and seasonal conditions while on Mars. Um, as we alluded to before, the intent of MOXIE, of course, is to prove that we can make oxygen on Mars, but at the same time, it's going to be used to scale up and, and produce mass amounts of oxygen. So in order to do so, the larger version will have to be running more continuously um, and, and run in very seasonal conditions. So that's part of what will be happening once we actually land on Mars. Um, so this model will be used to help understand during those longer durations and, and what the risks will be to validate where, where we can run and what under, under what conditions we can run. Um, so the thermal part of SOX and MOXIE itself is there's a really small temperature range uh, that's ideal for performance where we actually produce uh, an efficient amount of oxygen where our energy is being put to good use. But too high of a, a temperature condition can actually create carbon and that can jam up the system and actually cause a failure in it. So that's where this thermal modeling comes into play is, is one, where can we run when we actually ran our current version of MOXIE on Mars? And two, how can we extrapolate that data and use that in the systems like Eric is talking about for future running on Mars? Well, Thank you, everyone. Thank you to our panelists for a wonderful presentation. Um, so we're going to enter the Q&A phase of this uh, webinar. A reminder to alumni viewers to ask questions of our guests today using the Q&A feature in Zoom, where you can also upload questions you would like to hear. So there are a few that are already uh, in our uh, Q&A panel. Um, uh, maybe I'll start off by uh, asking a question of my own. Um, so, Dr. Hecht, I was wondering, the International Space Station also generates oxygen, uh, uses a different technology, right? And I was wondering if you would compare and contrast that with what you're doing, what, what you will be doing on Mars and why? That, yeah, that might actually be a better question for Jeff, but um, and I believe they're using, what, a sub process on the station? No, no, no. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I can take that. They actually, uh, both the uh, US and the Russian segments have electrolysis units, except they don't electrolyze carbon dioxide, they electrolyze water. Um, and there's, um, you know, you, it, it's actually a lot easier to electrolyze water than carbon dioxide. Um, we do, anybody who's been through high school chemistry has probably done that. Um, 
but in order to do that, you need water. Now, there is water on Mars. Um, we know there's ice deposits. The, the Phoenix experiment that uh, Mike was, was part of uh, actually dug a few inches under the, uh, the, the surface and, and there's lots of ice up there, but it seems to be up at uh, much higher latitudes, both north and south, as far as we know. Um, and in order to get access to it, you'd have to set up a mining operation, uh, you know, dig up the ice, uh, purify it, and then run it through, melt it, and then run it through electrolysis. Very complex. I, I suspect that um, someday when we have uh, people with a permanent base on Mars, um, they'll be able to set up and maintain a some sort of a mining operation, but it's going to be very difficult and, and something that's probably too difficult for our robotic technologies at the moment. And that's the big advantage, as Mike mentioned, of being able to take the carbon dioxide out of the Mars atmosphere uh, and electrolyze it because it doesn't matter where you are, the atmosphere is always there. So, so that's the difference between the space station and, and what we're going to do on Mars. And if I can add, the space station doesn't close the cycle. Um, they'd like to. There's been research to try to close it, even involving going all the way to carbon and you know having astronauts vacuum out the carbon. Uh, so that's something we can't afford to do on Mars. You know, they just to vent byproducts that we don't want. Thank you. That was uh, very enlightening. Um, so there are some questions here for our panelists. The one that most people want to hear an answer for is what was the biggest surprise during development? So either Dr. Hecht or Dr. Hoffman, who would you? You got it. I'm right. laughing it's from Howard Eisen. Um, I, honestly, the biggest surprise to me was winning to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, maybe you want to take a, take a crack at, at what it was during development. Oh boy. Um... You know, one of the one of the th things, an instrument like this, um, there have been so many small little problems. Um, you know, figuring out um, how to, you know, there's there's a lot of of little electrolysis uh, layers and and how to seal them all together. That, that was a big problem. They, they had continual leaks. Uh, you, you can't use rubber O-rings because it's, it's too hot, 800 degrees Celsius. Um, and they had to figure out, figure out that. Um, I, so, I mean, that's only one of the many, many problems. But the, the, the most critical thing that, that we have to, I think, worry about is we would like to produce as much oxygen as possible. But as Mike said, if you pull too much oxygen out of the carbon dioxide, then we deposit carbon. And, and that's the end of, of MOXIE. So uh, basically doing experiments, learning what the limits are, understanding it, um, and understanding how to work during the different seasons of Mars. One, one thing many people don't realize about Mars, unlike the Earth where we have variations in atmospheric density, you know, the barometer maybe goes up by a few percent or goes down a few percent. On Mars, it can vary by a factor of two. And, and we have to uh, basically uh, operate MOXIE in accordance with the current atmospheric conditions on Mars. And so not only do we have to uh, just worry about what MOXIE is doing, but we have to work with a couple of the other instruments on board, which will tell us what are the conditions of the Mars atmosphere so that we know how to operate MOXIE. So it, it's, a, it's a fascinating uh, uh, you know, interconnection of the different experiments on the rover. You know, perhaps the best answer to the question would be something we did not anticipate at all, and we ended up spending a tremendous amount of time and resources on. You know, unlike any real electrolysis system or fuel cell, 
we turn this one on and off and on and off and on and off every time we run. And it goes through tremendous thermal variations, being heated up to 800 C, cooling down to minus whatever, and heated up to 800 C. And each time it does that, it degrades a little bit. And getting that degradation down to the point where it was you know, well below our threshold and we can meet all our requirements, you know, took months, if not years, of chipping away at the problem. And I don't think when we started, we ever imagined that would be such a dominant problem. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there's a question from Alice Hoffman. Um, what is ex what is the expected lifetime of the system and what are the critical components that you expect any settlement would need to stock to keep a full size and redundant version working over the long term? Would there be a sudden failure or would performance degrade over time? wonder if this is something in Eric's uh, ballpark. I'm just going to suggest that. Yep. I'm sorry, could you repeat it? I've been answering other questions in the chat. What is the expected Sorry. lifetime yeah, of the let system? Me... And oh, what I, see, I see it. Okay, yeah. What is the expected lifetime of the system? And what are the critical components that you expect any settlement would need to stock a full, to stock to keep a full size and redundant yeah. version working over the long term? Yeah, so th that's a really good question. Uh, there's several degradation mechanisms that we have to worry about for a full scale system in many of the subsystems. So for the solid oxide electrolysis unit, uh, there's a there's um, basically what's called the um, area specific resistance of the electrolyte cells, and that can increase over time as you begin to degrade them from a variety of factors uh, that can include um, operating at the wrong temperature, car carbon deposition, oxidation of the, the cathode uh, if you don't have enough reducing agent present. So typically those are tied to cycling, we believe. So when you start up and shut down the system, it might be more prone to long-term degradation effects. So one of the benefits that's kind of working in our favor for a full-scale system is that we'd probably try and operate it uh, continuously around the clock to minimize that cycling and thus minimize the degradation. But even outside of the electrolysis unit uh, with the compressor, whatever type of compressor we choose, there's likely to be degradation. I, I mean, pumps on earth have an expected lifetime and um, we'd expect the same to be true on Mars. And so there's a bunch of different things you can do for that. One option that we're considering is putting several compressors and maybe even several electrolysis units in parallel with one another and adding some margin. So if one of those units fails and degrades too much and you need to cut it out of the system, you can just rely on your other parallel paths and it won't be a mission critical failure. Yeah, I can add to that, Eric, actually the fact that both Oxion and Air Squared are developing next generation units and they're sized such that you would use several of each. So, uh, you know, that's already in development in the works of maybe a, a module that could develop, generate, you know, six, 700 grams an hour and then you would have seven or eight of those. Uh, if we continue to follow that strategy, that also ensures graceful degradation. And that's the uh, you know time-honored uh, principle of redundancy, which has been involved in the space program since the very beginning. When you're in an environment where it's very hard to get out and fix things, uh, it's nice to have redundancy so that if one thing fails, you can replace it with something else. Thank you. Um, there's a question from Dave. Can you talk about vehicle sterilization and surface contamination? Who would like to take that? Mike, why didn't you do that? So talk about, so you're talking about planetary protection sterilization? I would imagine, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, of course, that's always a major issue. Planetary protection is an international treaty. We have to keep things very clean, both for treaty reasons and also so as not to contaminate the life um, detection aspects of both our experiment and even more critically, these samples we're going to return from Mars, the last thing we want to do is contaminate them. So it's taken very seriously. In terms of MOXIE, yes, every component needs to be sterilized. There were actually some innovative things done on MOXIE with gas phase, you know, peroxide sterilization at a component level. But ultimately, what it comes down to is HEPA filters, just plain old HEPA filters. 
are in some cases centered metal, metal filters to make sure nothing goes in and nothing comes out uh, the, other than pure gases. So that's really the workhorse. And of course it's sterilized and clean independently just as a you know, belt and suspenders. And remember that those gases that have come out have gone through an 800 degrees Celsius environment. So it's, it's you know, almost in, impossible that there would be any living organisms that went out with them, even That's if they got through the filter. Thank you. Um, I, I had a question about the use of the gold uh, on the outside. So, and that's for thermal reasons, right? So could someone explain Maybe Justine, is that that's your area, right? Thermal properties. Yeah, so I think Mike kind of made a joke about it earlier is JPL loves coating things in gold and that's because of the low emissivity that's in it. And so since MOXIE is installed inside of the rover, it's really important that since we're running at 800 degrees that we don't overheat anything else that's inside of the rover as well. Um, there's other experiments, I believe, uh, you know, at, at least, you know, a handful of other instrumentation that's inside their um, spectrometers and such that, that can only run at certain temperatures and only di designed for such. So it's a way of secluding ourselves inside of the rover. Yeah, indeed. And, and the one thing I think you're concerned about most, I'm sure Justine would agree, is not even whether the emissivity is low or a little higher, but that it never, ever, ever changes. Once you've designed the system and optimized the thermal balance, you don't want it to change. And gold should, is being inert, should ensure that it's the same from beginning to end. Fortunately, it's not in a place where we get dusty because that would, that wreaks havoc on the thermal properties, on the radiative properties. Great. Um, maybe we'll end with a forward-looking question for uh, either Dr. Hecht or Dr. Hoffman. What would be a logical next project B following MOXIE? Well, the, uh, can answer that two ways. I mean, what we're already engaged in, or the community is already engaged in, is looking at scaling up the system. And how do we make the real thing, the full size system? How do we deal with the other components of the system that MOXIE doesn't even address, like, like you know, capturing and compressing the oxygen or utilizing the CO2, closing the system? So that's one direction. The other question is, you know, where else can we use MOXIE? And we've had some very interesting blue sky discussions, for example, about using it on Venus, where you want to generate energy and you're already sitting there at very 90 bar pressure and 450 degrees centigrade. So a process that runs at 800 C and needs to compress CO2 has a huge head start. Um, so there's, you know, there's some wild stuff we could do and then the more mundane of how do we do the rest of the job so we can really use this on a Mars mission? Let, let me make one other um, look, looking ahead to the future, because I imagine many, many members of, of the alumni who are listening in today probably saw the movie The Martian. Um, and, you know, ultimately Mark Watney made his way to this Mars ascent vehicle and, and took off. The movie didn't really deal with where all of the oxygen came from in that ascent vehicle. In the book, they actually mentioned uh, briefly that there was a device called an oxygenator, which produced the oxygen out of the Mars atmosphere. And I'll just say that we like to think of the oxygenator as the uh, maybe the great great grandchild of Moxie. So looking ahead to the future, uh, someday Moxie uh, or its, its uh, progeny will, will help humans uh, explore the, the planet Mars and get home safely. Great, I think that's a wonderful place to end this uh, discussion. So thank, thank you, Dr. Hecht and Dr. Hoffman. Um, and uh, thank you also to Maya, Justine and Eric. Um, I think, uh, on behalf of the Alumni Association, thank you for tuning into this faculty uh, forum online and thanks uh, to everyone for joining us today. Alumni, we'll be sure to forward all questions asked via the Q&A to our speaker today and alumni office staff will keep the chat window open for networking purposes for another 15 minutes. Um, 
a reminder that this broadcast will be available on the MIT Alumni Association YouTube channel within a week of today. So thank you again, everyone, for watching. And uh, to the rest of us on the webinar, I think uh, you'll have to mute your audio and video because uh, you're still live. So thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.